Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join our webinar today as we discuss the various aspects of advising American expats. I'm Cam, uh, the resident financial analyst here at Dunn Financial, essentially the man behind the scenes. Uh, I primarily deal with the portfolio modeling and some of the risk analysis for our models uh, that I'm sure Brian will touch upon a bit later. Just a bit of housekeeping and a brief rundown of the format for this webinar before we jump right in. I'll be the moderator for this webinar with Brian as our star host for the hour. We will be putting everyone on mute as soon Please feel free to ask any questions in the chat and we will do our best to answer them for you. Or interrupt Brian to get his thoughts on the matter towards the end of the presentation as part of our Q&A section. Just before we start, a few disclaimers to go through for compliance purposes, so just bear with me. Daniel Financial is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale, purchase of any specific securities, investments or investment strategies. Investments may involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Please be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategies discussed herein. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Brian. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm coming to you from Barbados, so so uh, forgive the backdrop. It's a fake back backdrop, but uh, the sound of the beach is actually quite authentic. We'll start today by talking about uh, uh, one of the legends of economics, uh, Takeru Kobayashi. Now, he studied economics and um, a lot of us actually study him when we, uh, when we talk about economics, but he comes from a different faction of economics, which is actually hot dog eating contests. How can we think about Americans and not think about the great American hot dog eating competitions that we have every 4th of July. Now, Kobayashi, being an economist from Japan, started thinking about hot dog eating competitions in a different way from all of the big, large competitive eaters that typically won. It typically used to be that they'd eat between 12 and 14 hot dogs in 10 minutes, and they went through a process of saying, how many hot dogs can I eat in those 10 minutes? Kobayashi changed everything by changing the question. He changed the question from how many hot dogs can I eat in 10 minutes to how can I most efficiently eat one hot dog and then how can I replicate that over and over again? He did this by separating the hot dog from the bun, splitting the hot dog in two so that he was able to actually throw them down his throat, let it dislodge, go down through his esophagus into his belly without having to chew on it, i.e. not tire himself out, and dipping the bun in olive oil so that it would just slip down without the salt actually affecting uh, the saliva in his mouth. By being able to figure out how to do one, he was able to replicate this over and over again, and he actually set records actually getting up to 72 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Um, so. He was able to accomplish a, a very impressive feats. And I use this as an analogy because the entire semblance of this meeting is how do we build a replicable process that we can go ahead and go through, keeping things conservative and simple so that we can build great books of businesses and, um, and be able to assist as many Americans as possible. So this webinar will concentrate on those simplicities how to deal with easy situations if you have complex situations. Save them, we'll talk to them, talk about them in the, uh, the Q&A section. Um, otherwise, you'll have all of our contact information and please do contact us. We love talking about those. Today, we have a lot, a lot of things to talk about um, from the different acronyms, FATCA, FBAR, PFIX, et cetera, to where we should bank versus where we should invest. We'll talk about currencies, lots of currency movements over the summer. Um, so lots to talk about there. We'll touch on little things like social security uh, between different countries and totalization agreements, uh, dual nationality families. Uh, you might already have a client that uh, is married to an American and therefore you, you've been privy to a lot of these complexities. A Little bit on estate planning, 
and then our portfolios and, and how you might be able to use them to help these Americans. Um, so we're gonna be navigating this whole maze. Uh, so bear with us. If you do have any questions in the meantime, um, please do just type them into to the chat box. Uh, Cam will jump in and interrupt me um, to, to ask those or he'll keep them for the Q&A. John Burrow once said, a man can fail many times, but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else. Despite these wise words, we are in the age of Trump and Brexit. Therefore, let's start to point fingers. Most all American expats have had many negative ramifications from the Foreign Account Tax Compliancy Act, also known as FATCA. In fact, it might have led to the closing of your brokerage account in the United States or even your non-US bank telling you to go elsewhere. So it's Obama's fault, right? Not exactly. When you follow along with FATCA brought about, it's really introduced ways that American expats could get caught while not declaring taxes, owning PFIX, or even not declaring taxes that were owed. So if Obama just built a means to catch non-compliant individuals, why did everything change for expats in 2010? Well, rules from past presidents started to be enforced. Ronald Reagan, the beloved president that was in favor of cutting taxes, added a huge tax to American expats with foreign investments with the introduction of PFIC rules, also known as passive foreign investment companies. These were designed to prevent Americans from owning managed vehicles from foreign jurisdictions. So what about the notorious Nixon? In 1970, Richard Nixon signed into place the Bank Secrecy Act, and American expats had to report all foreign bank accounts that aggregate to over 10,000 US dollars. They have subsequently never increased this amount to meet inflation growth. If you haven't provided these documents, they can lead towards large fines. All the while, no tax is ever owed on these declarations to the Treasury Department. Until FATCA, Nixon and all subsequent presidents had no means to police the foreign banks and to enforce the rules. For the sake of pinning the blame for the frustrations behind being an American expat, we blame Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln may have abolished slavery in the United States, but made any American that moved out of the country de facto slaves, of which no other country other than Eritrea follows the logic, and even Canada has banned them from being able to do so. Abraham Lincoln introduced citizens-based taxation with the first income tax signed on August 5, 1861, and was a measly 3% of income to help fund the North in the Civil War efforts. All of the above culminated in what is now known as the FATCA Accords established by Barack Obama. This law was designed to increase the compliance of U.S. taxpayers that had reporting requirements for financial accounts that were held in foreign jurisdictions. To ensure compliance throughout the chain, the new framework imposed legislation onto both the individual and the financial institutions that service the U.S. persons. This led to the stricter reporting standards and larger penalties being imposed for non-compliance. With the newfound power in place, the FATCA Accords essentially became the international policing force for U.S. persons with foreign accounts and assets with over 113 countries having signed up to comply with the U.S. FATCA rules and an additional 200,000 plus institutions having registered with the IRS. So how did we get here? Well, we had a, a series of different deficits that grew and grew and now they're getting even worse with the coronavirus. Uh, essentially, we're looking at the first time since World War II in which the United States has a bigger deficit than it has GDP. And most developed countries are in that same position. So the IRS looked at cracking down on these tax evaders. If you, if you remember back in 2009, uh, we were talking about big moves in, uh, in, in Switzerland and UBS at those times was actually my employer. Uh, so they were basically saying that UBS was helping US tax uh, individuals evade taxes by hiding their accounts in Switzerland. Now, if any of you have been to Switzerland, you probably know UBS or Credit Suisse as more being the local retail banks. And that's to where 
most of those accounts that were closed down, the 52,000, were people, innocent individuals that just had a local bank account because they were Americans in Switzerland. Um, and that's where the negative ramifications have really come from. They're looking at a few tax evaders uh, that, that were using these as sheltered accounts and they're punishing a lot of people. So it's how do we find ways to help them be compliant? These rules have, have followed suit in other jurisdictions, but believe it or not, we have more tax havens today than we ever have had in history. Um, they've shifted to new places. We've all seen uh, all the conversations about the Panama Papers with the Queen of England even being involved in, in, uh, in some of those uh, instruments. So these types of things are not gonna go away and the policing by major companies is only gonna increase. And it's worked. That's why I'm saying it's only gonna, gonna increase because you can see that the IRS collected 4.4 billion in voluntary disclosures. This wasn't even catching anybody. That was just putting into place the law and, um, and people coming in saying, sorry, I didn't disclose this money. Please, can you take this tax and not punish me too badly? So FATCA has been a resounding success for the IRS. And um, that's to where anybody that I'm talking to, I sit on the advisory committee for American citizens abroad. We have a lot of conversations about FATCA as much as the 9 million American expats would love to see it be repelled. Um, I don't see any chance of Congress repelling FATCA. They might and hopefully will repeal PFIC rules or the FBAR rules or even better citizens-based taxation rules, but it's very doubtful that they'll get rid of FATCA. So that's where we need to figure out how we can comply to this, how we can help American citizens. Now, the first thing that we need to define is who it affects. Naturally, people that have accents like mine, we are all, all affected, the US citizens, naturally fall into this bracket. But even if you have a European or a Brit that moved to America and they become resident of the United States, everything that we're talking about, they have to comply with. So if your client moves to the States, even for only a two or three year period, you need to make sure to conform and those investments you're taking care of for them, you need to actually consider whether they need to be changed before they make that move or when they make that move. Now, here's the even more complicated one, green card holders. So somebody that's eligible to live in America, but they move back to the UK or Europe or any place else in the world, as long as they hold that green card, they have to actually make the disclosures just like anybody else. And they actually have to conform to all those rules. Now, the bigger problem there is that some of the green card holders from a long time ago don't actually have an expiration date on their green card and they have to turn it in. Um, so it's not, you can't just make the assumption that because you've left the, the US and that you haven't filed taxes that you shouldn't have been filing taxes. And finally, it affects everyone even if you have dual nationalities. I have two passports. I have to declare and confirm with, conform with all the rules of both of those, those passports. Um, so if you have a Brit that gets an American passport, make sure that they're not just using that UK passport and hoping that they don't get caught because these rules are built to try to catch people. So we'll start off on the easy ones. Uh, the FBAR reporting doesn't have any tax involved. It's just a report. It actually goes to the Treasury and not the US, uh, the, the US IRS. Um, so it's, what is it? It's just a document stating where all your foreign accounts are. From the video, you would have got that this was put into place by Nixon. By Nixon. Um, and, and what it was looking for was people that were setting up a foreign bank account and then using that to contribute money from whether it be illegal activities or untaxed uh, money, et cetera, et cetera. So they are legally allowed to share the information with the IRS, but it's not going to the IRS. It's more looking for crimes and the such. So over disclosure is better than non-disclosure. If you don't actually disclose this document every single year, you can get major fines and they accrue. Um, this is where people get into large trouble. Now. The problems with this form is that it's not the easiest to complete because they actually make you put in the high water mark for the year. And most banks, most foreign banks especially, don't exactly give you a high water mark value over the course of the year. Most of the time it's easiest to compute it on an Excel spreadsheet with the whole activity log so that you get that high water mark value. Um, another strategy that a lot of people will utilize is trying to keep 
their foreign bank accounts under $10,000, i.e. keep the bulk of their savings assets in US-based accounts, even if they're in pounds or euros uh, to do so. Those that have larger bills can't do this. So therefore, minimizing the number of accounts makes it a lot easier, i.e. having one main account where that, that large balance is sitting is the best way to do so because it's the aggregation of all your accounts. You can't just put $5,000 in 10 accounts where you have $50,000 uh, across the board and say, I'm complying because none of them are over 10,000. If they aggregate to over 10,000 at any one given day, that means you have to report all of them. The other important thing to, to think about is that any account that you're privy to the financials has to be declared. So for instance, I sit on the board of several uh, uh, charities and sh several nonprofits in, in Europe. And therefore, if I have access, if I was the treasurer or the president of those organizations, I have to disclose those financials on there, those bank accounts on my FBAR. Um, if you have a company, you have to disclose those on the FBAR. So very important, important to include them um, and very important to, to get those numbers right uh, because otherwise they can come after you. Getting into more of the meat and potatoes, I'll start with what you don't want to have, and that is any foreign investment. Mostly the Americans that are moving over to Europe and the United Kingdom have learned from these mistakes, and so therefore they don't have any, any passive uh, foreign investment companies. Now you have a few firms out there that are going around saying, PFIX are not a big deal as long as you use the QEF election. In the additional information at the end of the, of the presentation, I'll give you some links to some different accountants. I'm not an accountant, my firm, um, we're, we're not tax professionals, but we rely on these tax professionals and their information. And I still have not found one US tax uh, accountant that says the QEF election would be a great way of doing your taxes because you're just postponing your taxes whenever you have a PFIC issue. And therefore we've seen situations where we get 60 or 70% US taxes when you take the money out. So what exactly is a PFIC? Well, essentially it could be that you have a company where most of the activity is passive inside of it, but most of the time it's a USIT or an ETF, an exchange traded fund, that's trading in a foreign jurisdiction. So it's a passive instrument. So anything that looks like an investment that's not managed from the United States automatically becomes a PFIC. And that's to where you can get those negative tax ramifications. And even if you're not worried about the negative tax ramifications, the annual reporting that you're going to have to do are gonna be cumbersome. So I still, after doing this for over a decade, I've not found one situation that's merited having a PFIC. We've had several situations where we found it to be a problem to try to get out of PFIX because somebody has bought a PFIC through an advisor that didn't understand these types of situations. Those, please approach us. We'll try to help you find the most optimal solution to get out. Six or eight months ago, we had a great opportunity, which was a huge dip in the market, and therefore the penalties and the taxes are not so large. We're back on highs on the market, so might not be as great of an opportunity. Now, if we shouldn't be investing in European or British vehicles or any foreign jurisdictions vehicles, where should we be investing? Well, we need to have our bank accounts in the local jurisdictions, i.e. our savings and, uh, and our checkings account, just so that we can get access to money and pay, pay our bills easily. But for the most part, we would keep our investments in the United States. There's a, a certain number of situations where we will have assets over in Europe or the UK. Most of those situations, for instance, if you're, uh, if you're in the UK, um, we can build a US vehicle for an ISA or a SIP. This means that we're buying US investments, but buying them on a British platform so that we're conforming with the two sets of rules. But the main reason that we wanna have US sets of assets and why we keep those US individuals with their investments in the US is so that they get those 1099 documents, which make their taxes in the United States very easy, and most of their foreign taxes easy. It means that they don't have to fill out an FBAR form. We don't have to worry about any PFIC issues. 
and we don't have to worry about any safety issues. We know that a lot of these, these uh, pension systems, et cetera, et cetera, that are stating that they're, they're US compliant. The test of time will determine whether they're US compliant or not, because we're on common law and therefore it's all on precedence. If the US authorities don't like it, they can go against that. But the one thing that we know from a safety vantage point is that the United States knows how bank failures work. And uh, when, we, when we look back at Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns failing, none of the investors that had their investments inside of there lost money. If they had, say, structured products or those types of, of instruments there, they were on Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns balance sheet. But if they just owned shares in Apple or Google and held them at Lehman Brothers Wealth Management, they moved over to Barclays Wealth Management. They had three or four days where they couldn't figure out who they should be calling, but none of the actual assets disappeared. So the semblance of having SIPC and FDIC insurance in these accounts gives a great element of safety when you're comparing it to some of these island jurisdictions where we don't know how they would deal with a failure. The last thing is fees. Um, fees in the United States for platforms is much cheaper than they are on any platforms globally. Uh, for the most part, uh, our platforms in the United States don't charge a fee, they just charge a ticket fee for each trade that happens. Whereas most of the European platforms will charge between 30 and 40 basis points on any of the platforms, even when we're dealing with an American. So having something that's cheaper, more compliant, easier to explain, makes it easier to deal with Americans in that way. And that's why we keep those investments on the US side. But that means that we're having to deal with currency exposure because we might have the assets in the United States, but they might be, um, uh, the, the client might be retiring in Europe or the United Kingdom. If we're looking at shorter term assets, um, i.e. if we're looking at buying a house next year or in two years, we'd probably just use a future contract, a forward contract or options or swaps uh, for that currency risk. A very easy way to, to think about um, hedging that currency right now, the dollar's going down, so not much need of, of, of hedging it. But we've had 10 years in which it's been going the other direction, and that's to where uh, we've been saying to our clients, if you're gonna buy something in a year or two, we, we want to hedge it and we wanna think about it in the worst case scenario, um, what can happen. But when we're talking about the retirement assets, we need to be thinking about natural hedges. And natural hedges are so important for, for anybody that's in any country. Um, so we're going to take some time to talk about those. So a few little fun facts in there about, uh, uh, about currencies and, and, and some, some little uh, elevator talk for you uh, when you're talking about currencies. Um, uh, Isa, our compliance manager, she took care of building those videos. I think they're just a great, great way to articulate those. But we really want to dig into natural hedging. And if you don't know what natural hedging is, the easiest way to start from is what the world looks like if we look at the, um, the market capitalization of all companies around the world. And if we broke it up, it would come up to just over half of the companies in the United States or in, in the world 
would be American companies. Uh, 11% emerging markets, 14% Europe, 5% UK, Japan, 8%, and uh, 3% Canada, uh, 4% Pacific. So essentially, that would be the starting point of just saying we have no opinion about currencies or geopolitics or any of those activities, which naturally you as financial advisors, ourselves as, as investment managers, we always have an opinion about currencies, geopolitics, and the likes, even before we get to the granular vantage point of, um, of, of companies. But let's, let's pretend like we're in that utopia. That would be our starting point that we would look at. Now, breaking down how we value currencies, um, naturally, as economists, we're always looking at, at PPI. Um, but there's more fun ways of looking at PPI. And the most fun way, since we started the presentation on hot dogs, it would only be natural to move to uh, burgers and the Big Mac index. Now, interestingly enough, um, the Big Mac index, if you get to countries that don't have McDonald's, like Barbados, where I am right now, we actually have KFC here. So you actually rank um, a lot of the African nations, a lot of Caribbean nations on the KFC index instead of the Big Mac index. But the Big Mac index is the one that the economist publishes and the one that they utilize. And all they're looking at is all the ingredients inside of, of a Big Mac makes up a lot of the local economy. And therefore, they look at the pricing of what a Big Mac would cost in any country relative to what it costs in the United States. Now, what you'll notice is that there's only three countries that are more expensive than the United States right now, Switzerland, Norway, and Sweden. Everybody else is cheaper. So essentially, what we've seen over the last decade is a flight towards safety that's been uh, e extrapolated during this COVID crisis, but it was a buildup of a good decade. And just to kind of give a, a, an example of that, that decade, at the beginning of the 2010s, we were looking at the strong currencies being Australia, Canada, Norway, Sweden, United Kingdom, Switzerland, and the United States. Now we had a commodity shock in 2014, seems like an eternity ago, um, but Australia and Canada are very, very dependent on commodities and therefore their currencies dropped into that lower echelon. Um, they were no longer supported by their strong commodities. Um, so, so we were basically left with a, a, a smaller core of safe currencies. Naturally, we had Brexit. Um, I was hoping we could make it through an entire presentation without talking about Brexit, but we've seen what that's done to the pound. And um, Goldman Sachs actually put out last week that they might expect uh, the pound to get to parity with the euro. We wouldn't be surprised about this. We wouldn't be surprised if the pound goes into uh, a, a good decade lull like it did back in the 60s um, when the UK had to actually get uh, a couple uh, a couple bit, a trillion dollars worth of funds from the IMF. So uh, essentially, we're looking at no longer having strength in, in the pound and no longer having that be a flight to safety. And that's what leaves us with our remaining four of uh, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the US. And to where essentially we've had a flood in the US is that there's not that much investability in Switzerland, Norway, and Sweden. Um, and we've seen essentially. A, a, a housing boom in Sweden that's started to uh, deflate in that balloon. So we'd expect those same types of things to happen in Norway, Switzerland, and uh, uh, of course in the US. We've seen a 5% drop in the US dollar in the last month, and that's to where it's a wonderful opportunity to be caught talking to Americans of why they should be naturally hedging their portfolios, because they've had a decade of the dollar going up, now, if their lives and, and their retirements are going to be in pounds or euros, it's a good time to start making that change before it deflates too much. Too much. Now, there's other ways that you can be considering that financial plan because naturally the Americans are on the three pillar system, just like the UK and most European countries. Some European countries like France and Belgium are on four pillars. Um, the three pillars, as a reminder, government pension plus corporate pension plus personal savings, a third, a third, a third, uh, about, comes out to a full pension, i.e. the same amount that you were living on in, in your working years. The four pillars in France and Belgium, they add a fourth pillar, which is that they would expect that your house be paid off and therefore your bills would be lower, and that becomes that fourth pillar. Hence, in, Belgians, uh, in Belgium and in France, uh, they talk about having a brick in their belly, pay off your home, 
therefore you won't have the burdens in, in retirement. Now, there's other parts of Social Security that you should be considering. If most, if, uh, if um, uh, a Brit or um, uh, an American, I'm sorry, uh, a European spent most of their working life in the United States, their government pension is going to come in dollars. It doesn't have to. You can actually call up the Social Security Department. The administration is all done from Ireland uh, for any expats, and they're nice as could be. You call them, you tell them, I'd like this, to, my U.S. Social Security to be sent to my local bank in my local currency. They'll make that exchange at no cost. Naturally, every bank has some sort of fee or a spread. The Social Security Department's doing it on the Fed limit. So therefore, there's no cost to doing so. A great way that you can add value to your American client or uh, any other client that has an American pension by telling them they can get it sent to their UK or European bank in the local currency. Naturally, it's going to fluctuate with those currency rates, but you're not having to pay any money to get it over. The other thing that you need to really concentrate on is the totalization agreement. You've probably seen this if you have clients in Europe that go from country to country to country to country, that um, the, uh, the, the European countries will aggregate it. Um, we've had some trouble in Italy, but such is life. They're supposed to all aggregate it based on the last country you resided in. Now, a lot of these countries have totalization agreements with America. And even though the letter of the law states that you need to have 40 credits, which typically comes out to 10 years, four credits per year, um, but if you don't work too much in a year, you might not get all four credits, um, with a totalization agreement. So if you're a Brit and you only work two years in the United States, you're guaranteed to get a pension from the United States in that proportion. It won't be aggregated with your British pension, but you'll get a separate check from the US for a de minimis amount. And that de minimis amount can be sent directly to your British bank account. So great value to be added there um, because a lot of these Brits are not gonna be looking for that US pension because they're gonna hear that 40 credits and you have to call them. They're not gonna just assume that you worked in another jurisdiction that has a totalization agreement. You have to call the social security departments, apply for it, and let them know that you lived in these other countries that have totalization agreements. So great benefits at hand um, right there. The last piece is actually the bad news. Sorry, I left the bad news for last. There is what's called a windfall elimination provision. So you might get these four page documents from the social security administration that say that you're entitled to one pension. But with the WEP, if you've ever had any other government pension, which includes foreign jurisdictions, you are subject to the WEP, which means a windfall elimination provision, a reduction in that US pension. So the amount will be smaller than what's written on that top line because what's written into the bottom line. You're always able to calculate these. The calculators are directly on the IRS's website. If you have any trouble with uh, figuring those out, let us know. We're more than happy to help. That gets us into estate taxes. And these become interesting. They're, they're different based on every country. Some countries like the United Kingdom um, have double taxation agreements on estate taxes. And that makes things a lot easier because you can elect to have most of your assets in the regional country, i.e. in the United Kingdom. Other countries like France do not have a double taxation treaty with the United States when it comes to estate taxes. And this is where you can subject yourself to triple estate taxation. Say you're a resident in France, you're an American citizen, but you have a vacation home down in Spain that's paid off. That means you have an asset that's going to be subject to three estate taxes. There's ways to reduce these by simply getting a mortgage on the Spanish property you can actually reduce that because your estate is only the assets there. And if you have liabilities to set against them, you can reduce that down to zero potentially. But you need to strategize about those. You can also use user-free agreements, i.e. have your children own them, but you have um, free rights to certain aspects. Yes, there is going to be income provisions, especially if there's anybody here in the UK um, that, uh, that are, uh, listening in, you know gifting assets to your children, that means that on an annual basis you have to pay the rents. So it's not always the best strategy, but strategies if you're in France or Belgium or many of those civil law countries. 
But what you want to make sure of is that you first start with the double taxation agreement between the United States um, and the country that they're resident in, and that you're thinking about any new countries that they're adding in assets and how you're going to do so to minimize those taxes. If you have Europeans or Brits that have properties in the United States, it does the same thing. The easiest way, for instance, there's this little town just south of Orlando. I used to live right next to it called Davenport. And there's something like 30 to 40,000 Brits that live there. Now, any of them that have a good strategy, a good financial advisor that understands the American side of things will buy their homes in Davenport inside of a company, a US company because when they pass away, the company doesn't die. And therefore, they are able to pass that on without hitting the US estate taxes. If they don't and they put it in their own name, all of a sudden, that limit, instead of it being 11.4 million like it is for American citizens, goes down to 60,000. So lack of planning on estate taxes can turn into huge problems because of double taxation and triple taxation if you're not paying attention to them. The other thing to think about is the thresholds. The thresholds in the United Kingdom, they're quite low. We're subject to a lot of estate taxes in, in the UK. So gifting strategies become an important part of the strategy. In the United States, a lot of Americans haven't ever thought about estate taxes because we're not subject to anything um, until it hits 11.4 million. That being said, I don't think I have to tell any of you we have an election coming up in a couple of months and estate taxes are naturally a contentious issue when it comes down to it. So therefore, we might be looking at a reduction instead of a 20 year trend where we've gone from a 2000 having a $1 million exemption to all the way up to an 11.4 million. One day, um, I, I think it's in 2025, um, that has a sunset clause and therefore it will fall right back down if they don't change the law. So you'll find that if you're advising American expats, if you have an old couple and they have an excess of money beyond what they need in retirement, the gift tax and estate tax rules go in the same, i.e. you can gift up to 11.4 million by just filling out a gift tax return in the United States. So if somebody has way too much money, have them gift down to their kids, their grandkids and the likes and avoid some of those estate taxes just in case in 2025, Congress doesn't actually keep these, these thresholds at 11.4 million. If they reduce them down, the gifts have already been made and therefore you don't have to think about them. Good strategies for those, those ultra high net worth individuals. It becomes a little more complicated when you have dual national families. Um, if you have an American married to a Brit, you can't just gift the entire estate over to the non-American and say, done, we don't need to talk about America because you can gift up to 11.4 million from an American to an American. To a non-American spouse, you can only gift $155,000 at this point. And that only avoids that American side of things. So um, especially when it comes to France or, or other um, heavy estate tax and gift tax countries, Think about those conventions, the local rules versus the U.S. rules, but don't ever say just move all the money out of the American's account into the non-American's account. It can bring about Brian, a lot of problems. Yes. Tom Harrison, Perspective Thornton Springer. I was hoping that you would be able to confirm whether or not that's 155000 a year or whether it's a one-off. It's 155000 per year. Um, so it's a great point. Thank you. Because um, it's, it's basically 10 times the threshold of, uh, of what you can give to anybody else. So uh, essentially you're allowed to give $15,000 a year. Somehow the multiples have turned to 155,000 and you can do that each and every year gifting that over from the American to the non-American. Thanks Tom for that, that question. Um, now, how can we help? Now naturally we can help in advising you on little pieces um, because all of our clientele are American and everything that your American clients might have to deal with, I'm having to deal with it personally. Um, but we also have a, a set of portfolio offerings. You can either access them directly through us to where we put them on the US platforms, or if you're a European advisor, a UK advisor, you can actually do, um, access all of these portfolios directly through Premium. 
um, you can just go onto their website, pick us as the portfolio manager, and you're automatically invested in all these portfolios. Those options include general investment accounts, ISAs, and SIPs. It doesn't include the IRAs, 401ks, or any of those. Those you have to contact us directly, and we put you onto an American platform because naturally they have to be in the US. So what are our platforms really um, built? They're built as IRS compliant vehicles. They produce the 1099, and we focus on the local currency that your client's living in. So we have them in US dollars, euros, and British pounds. We also have a series in Australian dollars. We don't have them up on the premium system. We have those on our private system. If you know much about premium, it is an Australian uh, listed company based down in Melbourne. And so we've had some work down there that we've worked on. We set up each of the currency models in six risk profiles. You don't necessarily have to use our risk assessment system, but if you're questioning which one they would fall into, we're always willing to help. So you can use your risk profile or you can use ours directly. The country region is not specifically based on where your client is at that point in time. We would consider that where a client is going to retire should be which model they go into. So if you have an American in Europe, but they're gonna retire back to the United States, use the US dollar model. If you have an American in Europe that's gonna retire in Europe, use the Euro model. And same thing with the pound. If you have a client, like most clients, that doesn't know where they're going to go. I like to use the analogy of sailing from London to America. If you don't know whether you're going to sail to New York or Miami, you don't have to figure out day one because it's a long sail, just like planning for retirement. So you might start with the direction of going towards North Carolina. For those of you that don't know the geography of the United States, it's smack dab in the middle of New York and Miami. So now if you're going directly towards North Carolina, you have your time to go ahead and shift and tack up towards New York or south towards Miami without having to cover twice the distance by going all the way to New York and then down to Miami. I use that analogy because we naturally hedge our portfolios because we have opinions of where currencies are gonna go in the next year, maybe even the next three years. Cam can probably articulate to to use some thoughts on five or 10 years. But when we're talking about retirement plans of 30, 40 years, who knows where currencies are gonna move? So by removing some of that, by investing more in that currency that they're gonna retire in, gives us a lower risk profile for that individual. It reduces that risk. That's why nearly every portfolio manager in the United States, even though the world's market cap is 56%, will put in 85 to 90% into US securities. Same thing in the UK, most of your portfolios probably have 40 to 50%, if not more, in British securities. Same thing in Europe, um, even though the UK is only 5% and Europe's only 14% of the global market cap. So feel free to, to use two of the different portfolios to get yourself into that North Carolina position um, or weight them accordingly to be able to have ongoing conversations with the client and skew it based on their personal situation instead of just the markets for that point in time. And we're always happy to help and, and even sit on client phone calls if you wanna have that dialogue of which portfolio would be the best one for them. You can see when we put up our, our model allocations, these are just our different growth models. And you can see from the Euro model to the US dollar model to the GBP model, um, the burgundy portion, um, our firm color is the US dollar portion so you can see how it shifts uh, for those different allocations and then the increase of those local currencies. So very simple premise of naturally hedging those currencies. Hi, Brian, have you, you got go a our... sectoral split as well? Uh, yes, we do. Actually, if, if, if you go directly to our website, if you click on this link, um, there's a, a, a premium uh, service page, the US Selected Service, and you can actually click on all the two pagers for every single one of those portfolios for what sectors they're in. And you'll notice, especially in our, our European allocations, we're trying to avoid as many banks as possible. Um, so we try to minimize those. And we're a little bit heavier tech. We're a little bit more growth managers uh, than, than what you will see in most of the American expat space. Uh, most of our competitors are more value managers. So if you compare our portfolios to theirs for the last 10 years, 
we look like we've really outperformed. Um, I'd like to take all the credit for that, but I'm not going to sit there and say that that's because we're geniuses. It's because we're more growth managers and they're more value managers. So if we go into a value uh, period, they're probably going to outperform. Now, the big value is really amongst the banks and such, and I don't see the banks outperforming in the near term until we get through this financial crisis um, uh, at this point in time. Hopefully that answers your question there, Tom. Um, okay. So um, on, on this page on our website, you can actually go and you can see information on why, why we suggest premium as a great provider. Uh, like I said, for using US bank accounts um, uh, and such, we have other providers um, and we can go through those, but premium you can access directly without having to go through us. Um, we have our investment process in there and the two pagers for each and every one of the portfolios with uh, a little written description uh, that Cam puts together. Um, we also have our risk questionnaire. You can click on this link and you can see it's, it's a little bit different. Um, if, uh, if you've ever uh, read the book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, it's all based on that premise. So it's not your old, um, how do you view inflation? How do you lose, you view just the financial markets? It's just looking at risk and it gives you a number. Uh, like I said, you can use your risk profile or you can use ours, um, but we're happy to, to always uh, help on those. I found that Americans tend to like this system because it's shorter. Um, it, they're not having to spend a lot of time on uh, financial vocabulary that they might not feel comfortable with. The, the next thing that I'll present to you is, is that we actually have our own dashboard. And this dashboard will give you access to be able to view their old accounts. So if they have accounts that are back in the United States, you can actually link them on the left-hand side so that you can get a dynamic view of their entire portfolio. They can add any other assets that they might have, including real estate um, and their profiles, i.e. Um, their next generation, the properties, the vacation homes, and other assets that they might have. And they can do their own goal planning if, if they would like, or you can help them with it or we can be involved in that process. It's up to you. Um, it's how you would like to manage the, uh, the relationship. They can build their own budgets if they would like to. A nice, easy uh, to use tool for, for budgeting. And they can aggregate the investments. Not only the investments we're holding for them, but they might have 401ks that they wanna keep, or they might be with an American company that's continued to contribute to their 401k. But this gives you access and the client access to all of them in one place. A simple Dropbox folder, it literally is Dropbox, so they're not sharing it someplace else, uh, so they can keep organized with all their documents, um, and an aggregated view that they can sign in to see all of this. So a nice tool uh, for, for our dashboard um, that you'll get access to as well as us. A few articles about us. Um, we've, we've received a few, uh, a few awards from International Advisor um, when it comes to our investment planning process um, and uh, a few articles about the write-up. We just built this product last year with Premium. So if when you look at the uh, stat sheets, you're only going to get a year and a half worth of performance because that's when we started them with Premium. If you'd like us to show them back-tested, um, we can give you the back-testing on that. Um, and um, that's not a problem. You can always contact Cam or myself, uh, but uh, that's not through the premium solution. Um, that was just when we were just a financial advisory shop. The other thing is we're not the only American expat shop and we're not going to try to push ourselves as being that, but we will try to help you evaluate what you should be looking for when your clients are looking for an American expat shop and, um, and, and when you're interviewing different shops. So this is an easy way that you can show that you've done your due diligence, whether it be talking about us or anyone else. The first thing, it's a very American concept, is what is a fiduciary? It's a great British comedian that's in America called John Oliver, who did a 20 minute piece on it. And um, I found that many Americans enjoy that way of learning about what a fiduciary is. Uh, but simpli simplistically, it just means that you always have to put your client's best interest uh, ahead of your own. And that brings up the second point, which means, which, which every fiduciary has to comply with, 
which is that they don't receive any commissions from the client. So any of these trading fees that premium or anybody else charges, we're not allowed to receive any portion of it. And any funds that we sell, we're not allowed to receive any kind of kickback or shelving fees. Um, shelving fees in the United States have not disappeared. Um, they're still in Europe and the United Kingdom, but Americans will reference those. So being a fiduciary and not collecting any fees except for from the client are very important. Americans are fixated on fees. So we've run the numbers for you. Uh, we took all the American expat firms that we could find, and we found that the lowest fee structure was 0 0.35 basis points, uh, a little small robo-advisor down in Spain. The highest fee uh, from any of the firms was 2.8% uh, from a Dutch company um, that, uh, that actually sells PFIX. Um, so I can't figure out how you guys can make money um, and they can make 2.8% while the client has a chance to make money. The average is 1.24%. Um, so, so you can see it's, there's, there's both sides of that. Uh, our product, if you go directly through premium, our management fee is 50 basis points, 0.5%. Um, so closer to the low end of, of things. Um, if you're asking us to engage in financial planning help, then we engage in, in a fee arrangement with your firm and our fee structure starts at 1% and declines. That's not us trying to undercut our competition with the average being 1.24%. That's just because if we were a broker dealer, i.e. a Merrill Lynch, a Wells Fargo, a Goldman Sachs, any of those firms, and we were receiving 12B1 fees, i.e. Uh, uh, payments from the mutual fund companies, the highest they, the 12B1 fees are, are 1%. I don't think that by basically being transparent, I should charge more than not being transparent. I don't think that's acting like a fiduciary. And that's why I start the fees at 1% and reduce them on scale there. Uh, the next questions are easy ones. Are they re regulated in, in the United States through the SEC? And are they actually regulated in Europe or the United Kingdom through their country that they're doing business? These are easy things that you can look up through those systems and we'll actually give you the links, which um, the, the broker check is the link for the US side of things. Uh, the next piece is whether they sell PFIX. Um, I would say amongst all the American expat providers that we all agree that PFIX are the wrong way to being a fiduciary for American expats. And therefore, if you're selling PFIX, you're going to go ahead and you're gonna breach those fiduciary comp, uh, uh, orders. And, um, and uh, so that's where I would avoid any company that deals with PFIX. Now, the last one is an easy one. You always want to do the due diligence um, that uh, uh, you want to deal with on any of those parts. And on the U.S. side, any of us that are U.S. regulated, we all have to disclose all of those on broker check. So a very easy way to find all of the paths that, uh, that um, they've ever dealt with. But those would be the questions that I would be looking at. Now I'll give you a few resources. Now, the first one, a little conflict of interest, because if you look actually about ACA, you'll see in the drop down that I'm on their advisory committee. But it is a wonderful organization um, for a, a de minimis fee. Any Americans can actually become part of the ACA, but you can actually get on their distribution list for free. Um, I would suggest if you're dealing with Americans, that you put this in your in your uh, key reading pages because they're not only a lobbying organ organization, but they're also an advocacy group. So for instance, we have a UK webinar that we give every three months, same thing in, in Italy, Belgium, France. So localized webinars, typically I'm one of the hosts on there. Uh, Mary Louise, who is our lobbyist in DC, she's actually on the ground talking to congressmen and senators uh, sits on a lot of those calls and you can get right to the horse's mouth for all that information. So a great resource to find information and find ways to help American expats. We've put together uh, an, an American expat financial guide. You can get access to it for free. Um, has some great articles from uh, Adrian Leeds, who's a, a wonderful real estate agent for Americans in France, and Christine Sullivan, uh, who works over at Fragomans as an immigration attorney. Uh, a lot of pieces on just all the information that we've covered today. I know we've covered a lot, um, but there it is in writing so that you don't have to sit there and jot down all of the notes. Uh, like I said, um, we're not tax accountants, so I, I don't expect you to take my word that PFIX are not the, the right thing to invest in. 
Um, but what we've given you is some articles on PFIX. And what I would say is before you ever suggest a PFIC to any client, even with the QEF election, talk to your U.S. tax accountant. Make sure that the, your client's tax accountant understands the burdens that they'll be taking on and the potential tax ramifications. The U.S. expat directory is also a wonderful place that you can find other professionals. Um, if you're going to be working with Americans, you're probably going to have situations where you need an attorney, whether it be an estate, uh, an estate planning attorney, a currency specialist, a real estate agent, mortgage specialist. Um, you know, mortgages for Americans are different than mortgages for everybody else because the, t the, the mortgage is separated from the actual home. You could have two different tax situations. Um, so you need a mortgage specialist that understands those and naturally a U.S. tax accountant. So the U.S. expat directory is a great place that you can find people that um, we've uh, interacted with and that we know understand the American side of things. Broker check is the place that you can find um, our background as an SEC registered firm um, and any other firm that you might be dealing with. Um, if you pull up our background, you'll find that I've never had any bankruptcies, nor has any of the companies I've been involved with. I've never had any client complaints, um, nor has any of the companies that I've, I've been uh, registered with. And, and therefore, you can find all that background nicely written up with, with my entire background, um, uh, like it was a CV. Uh, the IRS website that has all the double taxation agreements, you naturally want to have this as a reference point. They're normally 60, 60 to 70 pages and they have shorter descriptions that you can utilize that are more in layman's terms instead of legal terms directly on that website. And naturally, please feel free to reach out to our entire team. Um, Isa is our compliance manager, also our, uh, our uh, chief cartoonist of all the videos that you've seen. Cam, uh, who you heard at the beginning of the presentation is our financial analyst, and he helps design the portfolios alongside with me. So if you would like a, a different representation, a little bit more information, um, please feel free to reach out to, to the two of them. Um, Laverne is our UK specialist. So if you're in the UK and you're having to deal with ISAs and, um, and SIPs or any forms of pensions, um, a lot of those go right over my head. And um, she's a great resource to, uh, to uh, lean on 